So good yeah. evening. Welcome to Pacific Northwest Sculptors virtual September meeting. Uh, there's a lot of new faces here, and uh, <laughs> I hope uh, I hope you'll enjoy the meeting and come back and participate some more. Um, I'm Chaz Martin, and our guests this evening are Jennifer Corio and Dave Fry from Cobalt Design Works in Vancouver. Before I get around to introducing them, we have a couple of meeting items we need to take care of. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and it will be loaded to the web page in a day or two. Uh, you can look at, at all of the past meetings there. Uh, there's been some interesting presentations. Uh, if you have questions, rather than interrupt the presenters, please use the chat function and I will try to monitor those. Um, if I miss any, um, maybe Shelley or someone else can point some things out to me from time to time. Uh, there's a lot of things going on right now. Uh, the board Friday will uh, review a proposal to overhaul the website, which is long overdue for some major work. Uh, we have applied for a grant. Whether we get that or not, we are going to move forward. Yeah, the board, uh, this is Dave, I'm vice uh, president on the board. So while Chaz reconnects, maybe update. We're, we are planning on setting together a project to move forward with a website update in the next few months. Like you say, hopefully we'll have some grant money or not. Uh, and so those are, those are kind of a big, and also for those members that have some interest, we are definitely looking for volunteers around helping us with that. So if you have some interest and willing, uh, please contact Shaz or myself on that one, or Andy Kennedy, who's our volunteer, volunteer um, coordinator as well. Uh, with that, I think we did want to go through and update the members on Treasury. So, Shelley, I believe you had, had a short update for us on that. Yeah, yeah, happy to. Um, we have in the account um, uh, 3547 currently, and um, a lot of that is due to some sponsors, which we greatly appreciate. And I just wanted to mention um, uh, donations to us. We are a nonprofit uh, charitable group, so donations are tax deductible. Um, we got a generous donation from Tall Grass LLC, KC Fuller Group, Nayanico, an anonymous donor, and Art in the Pearl. So we greatly appreciate that help, yeah. which is going to help us with our website if we don't get that grant. And um, so we greatly appreciate that. That's great. Thank you, Shelley. Yes. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. And um, it's so neat to see so many boxes filled with faces that are familiar and a lot that aren't familiar. Uh, Dave and I are quite um, excited and honored to be able to share a little bit about our artwork and our process today. So as we were prepping, um, we saw several different directions that we could take. And in the end, we decided on a combination of a little storytelling, some sharing of our artwork and our process, but also while talking a lot about the public art process and um, all the things that we've learned along the way. Um, I hope there's maybe somebody in the audience who is interested in dipping their toes in public art. And that if so, that this is educational and encouraging to you. So Dave and I split up um, the presentation. I'm gonna start by sharing a little bit about our background and how we've evolved our skills and our art and our focus over time. And I'll also share some insight on how um, I approach concept development and design. Dave's gonna take over and he's gonna talk more about the whole making of our art in his shop and um, all the non-art making details that go into large scale uh, public art commissions. Um, so Dave and I met 23 years ago, and a couple weeks ago, we celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary. And we were recently talking about, geez, if anybody had told us back then that we would be making a life and a career out of making art together, we would have laughed at you. 
uh, we just would have looked at you incredulously because at that time um, we were very absorbed in building our career in careers in high tech, um, kind of in a corporate space. We met at Hewlett Packard here in Vancouver, Washington, which is where we still live today. Um, Dave was, still is, a mechanical engineer, and I was new to product marketing after switching um, from my previous work in education and manufacturing engineering. So the concept of art was, wasn't even on the radar. We really didn't even know that many artists. They just weren't in our circle, um, our circle of friends. But what's interesting now, in hindsight, we can see that maybe there were some dormant seeds lying there. Um, they um, just needed a little nurturing um, to blossom. And I have become a big believer that every one of us has these seeds of creativity inside of us. And um, it's just if and how they manifest in themselves. And really, I think it's our greatest life work to um, discover what that, create, what that creativity is for us, because it, it shows up in all sorts of ways and in everything that we do, um, and basically how to share that with the world. I would say that Dave had the more obvious seeds at first, or uh, the one that was like most ready to sprout. I've always said that um, I think Dave was born a craftsman. He was born a maker. He is um, happiest when he is working with his hands, when he's in the shop, when he's building things or fixing things. Um, he grew up farming in the beautiful Palouse region of Idaho. And so he was always tooling on the farm equipment there. And then um, he got into modifying cars and customizing cars. I mean, I guess a gearhead. Um, he loved cars so much that he did auto mechanic school in California. And while he was there, he and a friend um, started a racing team, a drag racing team, and Dave built the drag racer. Um, his friend Jeff was the driver. But of course, they're starting to travel all around, so they need something to haul this dragster on. So Dave, you know, makes the trailer to haul it on. And even when he started doing engineering work in a more corporate kind of environment, um, he still kind of had this small side hustle building these trailers and still racing and um, continued, still continues to this day to be the go-to metal guy amongst all of his friends. As for me, my artistic exploration kind of started on a whim. I signed up for a welded sculpture class at uh, Clark College. I was really burnt out uh, with my work at HP and I convinced them to give me a leave of absence so they let me take six months off. So I found myself in Beth Heron's class. Um, hopefully some of you know her because Beth is a very early member of Pacific Northwest Sculptors. And during that time, I think it was 2001, she invited all of her class to go to a PNWS meeting. And it just happened to be at Lee Kelly's studio, who is a big name um, in the sculpture world. And Beth herself is a very accomplished sculptor, um, very well known. So I go to this meeting and um, I meet Manuel Izquierdo there, another big name, and then all like a lot of these uh, artists, part of PNWS, and everybody was just so welcoming, even to us students who were so new to this and didn't even know the right questions to ask, but it was a fascinating evening because, um, you know, they were walking through this kind of sculpture forest on uh, Lee Kelly's property and um, hearing them talk about their art share art ideas, share art stories, share about their inspiration behind the art. And um, it was just so communal and sharing and fun and um, definitely an indelible memory for me. Um, this class, unfortunately, they don't teach it anymore. I think Beth moved to California, but 
it was the coolest class ever. So half of the class would be in the classroom and Beth would be teaching us the basics of design. We would look at lots of pictures of sculptures, famous sculptures, sculptures local to the area and even sculptures of previous class, uh, class members and things that they made. And um, I was learning a new vernacular there. Uh, I was learning kind of a new way to process, um, you know, inspire ideas and process things, um, get ideas, uh, get them out of my head and onto paper. But the biggest thing I learned there was, I mean, Beth was teaching me how to see differently, how to view the world differently, um, definitely with a keener eye and with uh, much more intention and mindfulness. So not just looking at objects around the world, around me, but objects as they related to other objects and objects in the space around those objects. So it was really like this eye opening experience. Now the other half of this class would be down in the welding shop where Beth was teaching us um, oxyacetylene welding, MIG or wire feed welding. We eventually graduated to arc welding. Um, we were learning how to flame cut, plasma cut and learning all these cool, scary tools. Um, and I would come home, Dave and I were newly married at the time, and you could see his eyes light up because I would go, oh, I learned how to MIG weld today. And he would grab me and take me out to our little garage at the time where he had all of his equipment that I never cared about before. Um, he would pull out his small MIG welder and then he'd pull out his big MIG welder and, um, you know, he had multiple of every piece of equipment. So he started teaching me some techniques as well. So he became a, a great teacher for me and in the mud shop as well. So I think this class um, was the fertilizer needed to kind of get both of our seeds to sprout. So from there, Dave and I just started uh, making sculptures together for fun, kind of as a hobby in our garage. I would come up with design concepts and we both um, work together to bring them to life. Over time though, I found that my truest love was on the design side of things. And so I, I would spend less time in the studio or the shop with Dave and I would uh, leave him be and let him do what he does best without any interference from me. <laughs> and I can definitely be interference. Um, <laughs> and I will say that the fact that we have our own spaces is really key to what makes this partnership work. I mean, we are by ourselves in our own spaces for the majority of the day, only coming together at certain times when um, we have to collaborate, but uh, that space is very well needed. Now, because I have such a love for, for curves and uh, feminine, graceful forms. I have challenged Dave a lot over time when um, back then he was more used to boxy, angular type of style. So Dave though seems to relish in these challenges and he keeps upping his skill, his fabrication skill. And as he uh, improves his techniques, that allows me to kind of up my design too. Um, so it's a great give and take. Um, I would say that this partnership, especially early on, ha helped strengthen our early marital bond because it for forced us to continually be working on um, our communication skills, our listening skills, our patience with each other. Um, we call it our dance of collaboration and there's a lot of give and take. And we have to play nice because in the end we go to bed uh, every night together and uh, we have a deal that we're not going to go together, go to bed together angry. Um, I show this slide. There was another big factor that helped me kind of make the decision to keep on this artistic path. Um, at this welded sculpture class, I met a group of women also taking the class, also super excited about everything that they were learning, and we became very fast friends. And this bond um, was amazing. We would get together and we would uh, talk about what we were learning. We would share ideas. We would brainstorm ideas on collaborative projects to do together. We had our first show. Um, we ended up 
I think one of the teachers dubbed us Women Who Weld and it just stuck. But we had a group show with all of the works that we made in class at WSU, the Vancouver campus. And it was wonderful, it was so fun. It, a lot of people came and a lot of cool opportunities came out of that. And the reason why I bring this up is because I think if it wasn't for this early camaraderie that I found that I probably would have returned to work and Dave and I would not be here telling our story today. It's kind of one of those sliding glass door moments. So after that show, um, somebody from WSU tapped Women Who Weld to create a uh, memorial sculpture for a beloved professor who had passed away there. Um, so this was a pretty big deal for us. And I was the lead artist on this. And because I had the, the experience in my work life of doing project management, everybody pointed to me like, you're doing that part, Jennifer. So even early on in the art world, I was out there trying to hire structural engineers. I was hiring concrete contractors and um, working with other fabricates, fabricators for the big rebar structure underneath and just all the things that allow it to come together. So I got a really early taste for the public art process. Now, right on the heels of that, the city of Vancouver came to Women Who Weld and asked us to create a monument uh, for the women who worked in the Kaiser shipyards here in Vancouver. It's such an important part of Vancouver's history, but one that at least at that time, that story wasn't told all that much, at least not through art. Um, and so um, Sumi Wu was the lead artist on this, but again, I was project manager and it was another amazing project. And again, even though she was the lead designer, we worked collaboratively on each of our pieces and there's a little piece of each of us in um, in this sculpture. So fast forward a few years and Dave and I decide it's 2008 and we decide to get much more serious. We start Cobalt Design Works and decide to do this uh, more as a business, try our hand and get serious about art making. And because we had this experience, this taste of public art, we decided we wanted to try our hand at uh, going larger in our pieces um, and making them kind of outdoor proof weather wise. And, you know, you can't just, uh, you don't just get public art opportunities, but not like those ones that came to us. So what we did is we started applying to these uh, rotating sculpture ex exhibitions. So um, these are lots of cities. There's so many of them around now. They jury in art and you bring your piece of art to them and they're basically kind of renting it or, uh, for a year or more common too. So you can see um, we're increasing our scale. You can see at this point we're starting to play around with color. Um, that was the start and we've used a lot of color since then. And here was a time where we're really playing with pure abstraction and um, in form and the color. So with these, um, I, for anybody who asks me if, if they're interested in public art, I tell them you have to start here. Because with each uh, piece that you get out into one of these exhibits, you can say that you have a piece of public art out there. It goes on your resume. You're building your portfolio. I tell artists if they want to do this, then start scaling up your art. Start working at it so it's more weatherproof. And then start getting on these lists and applying to these calls. Now, the vast majority of them, they come right back to your studio. They don't sell. They don't really get out there uh, permanently. So then you've got all these big pieces hanging around your studio. So <laughs> each of these pieces has been in at least two shows and they still exist in our studio and are looking for places, uh, looking for permanent homes. But occasionally um, they turn into opportunities. And this was Rise. She was an early large sculpture of us. She first hung out at Moses Lake and then she went to Puyallup. And um, she won the People's Choice that year, so they bought the piece and it became part of their permanent collection. 
This is another one. This was a exhibit down on the San Diego Bay. Really cool. If you were juried in, they'd send you this six inch diameter pole where you make some kind of artistic abstracted fun tree out of it. And this is where the whole umbrella thing began with us. And you can see that we're playing with color. But this one also came back after a year. Um, but soon after that, we got a call from the gentleman who's on the right, uh, Claude. He had seen it in San Diego, loved it. And he ended up purchasing it and gifting it to his hometown, the city of Burlington, Washington. And that's after we just installed it for him. It's at a park and ride up there. And then another piece, wind and waves. So these are just ideas that I had in the sketchbook and then we kind of decide, oh, this would be the fun next one to make and then shop it around for these exhibitions. So this one spent time in Lake Oswego and Hood River and then a lot of time in our studio. And then it was purchased several years ago, but it took a while to actually get its home on the waterfront because the buyer did want it to be a waterfront piece. So we just installed this piece in February on Vancouver's new um, beautiful waterfronts. So that's sort of how we dipped our toes. And in the meantime, we're building our portfolio um, and we're building our resume. But there really are um, multiple avenues to public art. Calls for arts, they come in all different flavors. This was our first one that we actual, actually won in kind of a comp competitive call for artists. It's up in Bremerton, really small budget. And I think if you're just dipping your toes in, again, you kind of need to look for the smaller budgets where you might have a fighting chance. Um, but it had a Pacific Northwest theme and we already had this tabletop sculpture that we loved of this umbrella girl. And we decided, oh, I wonder if we could scale it up and make it outdoor uh, proof and if it could be a good pedestrian scale piece. And the design resonated with them enough to choose the piece. And so now that sits in Bremerton, Washington. Calls for proposals are another route. Um, this is where the commissioning agency is actually soliciting proposals. Now, these are a lot of work for artists. Uh, they're getting a lot of creative design for free, um, which I think if you've been, if you're a more established art or artist, you sort of stay away from these, but as an emerging artist, Sometimes your resume and your portfolio really can't compete with uh, the more established artists. But if you have a good idea and a concept that you love and you put it in front of the jury and they just, it resonates with them and it might, res it does, you know, it doesn't matter about the experience. They're really resonating with the piece of art. So here's a couple of examples where, um, we propose these, you know, first they're just sketches and then we use CAD to show them kind of 3D renderings of them. We'll often um, superimpose the rendering into a Photoshop image of the site so they can get a good feel. So we've learned a lot over time of, you know, how to uh, continuously improve on these applications and um, so they're readable and they're um, believable and uh, the, the commissioning agency will take you seriously. So calls for qualifications are where they're vetting you as an artist, they're vetting your portfolio and your resume first. So if they see that they love your style of art, they see that you've done a lot of art uh, projects, in this budget scale and they can rely on you to actually bring it to reality, then they'll choose finalists. And um, from there, usually they'll have the finalists submit proposals and they'll often give you a small stipend, maybe a, a thousand bucks to come up with the proposal. And then you're basically competing with uh, finalists on your, uh, on your proposal and they'll pick the one that resonates the most with them. <clears throat> Sometimes they won't make the finalists come up with uh, a proposal. Sometimes they'll just interview you. They want to see if they like you and if they want to work with you and if you really um, are who you say you are and they'll ask questions about, you know, the actual uh, making of the public art and uh, 
seeing if they can trust you, I guess. Um, and then once they uh, select you, then they'll have you, just you though, submit maybe two, if not three proposals. This one was in Coeur d'Alene and we were chosen as a finalist and they asked all the finalists to create an actual physical model, send it to them and then they put it out at their library so the community could come in and um, I don't know if they voted, but they definitely got their say and they got to comment on them. Um, and then the, the panel who was making the final decision would take all that input. So we submitted this um, umbrellas gracilis and they really liked it. So they chose it and we obviously ended up going with a different color palette and worked with them on color. That can be really interesting because um, color is complicated. That's my mantra. Um, and this at the time was our largest piece to date. It's like 23 feet high. And this is a, one of our more recent public art, same way we were chosen as finalists. This is in Moscow, Idaho, Dave's hometown. Um, this is a cool one. It was very, very site specific. Um, the, trans, the state transportation department got involved. So the art could only start 10 feet up in the air and it had to be held up by poles that were um, no bigger than three inches in diameter. The theme was kind of slowing down or a, kind of cultivating a sense of coming home because it's at this complex intersection where the state highway kind of funnels into downtown Moscow. So I use um, birds as a metaphor for community and gathering in community. So another way art commissions come about are through private developers. There's a trend with private developers wanting artwork for their properties. Um, some of them use it as a way for them, their properties to be more unique and a way to draw clientele to them. But probably more than not, um, more and more cities and municipalities are, um, they're incentivizing private developers to, um, or commercial developers, I should say, to add unique elements or features for the community. Um, and so public art is one of them. It can be some unique kind of landscaping type stuff. And in return for this, uh, the developer will get some um, tax incentives or tax abatements, um, which is, can be lucrative to them. And I must point out that this job right here, this was this, uh, it's in a apartment complex that a developer had renovated. And um, they found us on the Pacific Northwest Sculptors Gallery page. They saw one of our umbrella pieces and they really liked it. They wanted that exact one, but uh, we didn't want to give them the exact one. Uh, so we created this one and since, and then we were kind of on the umbrella roll by this point. Here's another one called Bubbles, um, commissioned by a developer. Uh, this piece, Blossoming Joy, definitely our largest piece to date. Um, this is on a roundabout in Kennewick, Washington. It was commissioned by a credit union, STCU. They were trying to make inroads into Kennewick and get some branches there. And kind of what I've uh, realized is that credit unions are really competitive with each other. And their, their MO is to, um, really, they're very community oriented. So. Um, they're often finding ways that they can give back to the community. So Kennewick already has a very established public art program. So STCU, um, they commissioned us to create this artwork for them and then they gifted it so they could then um, be part of the public art uh, collection there in Kennewick. And then another area that's kind of getting popular is hospital art. There are companies whose sole existence is to curate all the art for hospitals. Um, and there probably are ones for hotels as well. But so um, their client is the hospital, but also the artist, because they'll put out calls for artists and they try to develop relationships with artists um, who they can then um, jury in their artwork for the hospital. 
And there seems to be a trend in all these calls where hospitals, they're trying to get away from being sterile. They're trying to be more inviting. A lot of the calls want um, uplifting, calming art. They want you calming or vibrant, vibrant colors. Um, they really want the arts to make the hospital environment much more um, welcoming and comforting to patients and the people who visit them. So this was for a hospital in Wisconsin, and the, the actual client had the ideas about these photo ops with the umbrellas. And again, I think they Googled uh, metal outdoor umbrellas and they found us. So I, this was a fun project. Donor gifts is another way that um, same gentleman who bought Sprouted Bumper Shoot and gifted it to the city of Burlington, he ended up commissioning us to create a tulip piece for the sister city of Mount Vernon, who's known for their tulip fields and their tulip festival. And um, then this was gifted to Mount Vernon. So that was a very fun piece. This remains one of my favorite pieces. I think Dave's too. Um, recently installed this piece, a great blue heron. There is a woman up on Samish Island and there's a whole story up there about the flight of the herons. They kind of left and didn't come back to this big heron rookery. So even though it's on her private property, it was really important to her for the public to see it. And really, it's such a small island that everybody passes by this property um, when they come on the island. So it's an example of art that the public can enjoy, but it sits on private property. And then finally, there's another way um, for these calls for art. You can apply to try to get on art rosters. And lots of cities will have them. Um, so basically they contain pre-selected group of artists. So instead of um, like Washington State for public places, so this is with uh, the percent for art monies that uh, come from state agency capital funding. So a half a percent goes towards art and then they keep this roster for when they have the projects um, they don't put a call for artists out. They just work with, in this case, it was an elementary school that had some renovations. So they have a vetting process where they'll show um, all the art that's available or kind of the style. And then they, the, the committee picks the art that resonates the most or the artist that resonates the most. So then this was a story of patience and persistence because we, it took three times for us to get on this roster. You can only do it every three years to apply. Um, so we've also learned not to take things personally. You get a lot of rejection um, and I'm getting much better about not taking it personally. Art is so subjective. So just because one jury didn't choose your artwork and you never know, it could have been the next in line, but you, they never tell you that, um, you know, the next one, will love your art. So just keep putting yourself out there is the big lesson. Um, so this was in an elementary school in Puyallup, Washington. And I figured I would use this to kind of tell you a little bit about how I do my conceptual development. Um, so this is what we had to work with. This is the site. The building in the back was the new development and the, the corresponding courtyard. So these elementary school kids will walk from one building to the other through this beautiful walkway. And so they wanted uh, artwork for this area. And of course, remember, they've already vetted us. So by the time we get there, we already know that they like our art. And um, this was the best committee to work with. And I have to say that by far, this part of the process, the early part working together with um, the committee is mostly my favorite part. I mean, there's certainly um, some committees are nicer to work with than others. But this one uh, was made up of students at the school. It was made up of staff and teachers and parents. And they were just so enthusiastic. So some of the things um, that what I like to do is I like to hear from their mouth what they're looking for. So I went around and, you know, even the kids talked about what they love, what they would love to see. And 
Um, I take that and it fills my head. It helps uh, establish kind of my image bank in my head. And then I call all the information that I get and try to come up with concepts that really meet what, what they want, um, but still in our distinct style. So with this group, they loved the bright colors. They loved the joyful pieces. We went through the portfolio and I knew the ones that they loved the most. So um, it, it, it was very fun to work with this. I knew immediately because it's so low, the buildings are low and you have this pathway and they're going to be seeing the art as they're walking. I knew that one monolithic piece didn't make sense. And these uh, kids, their mas mascot is the trailblazers. So I kind of took on the idea of blazing trails as they're going, walking these pathways and um, making discoveries. So they find these little curiosities along the way. So I came up with three pieces of art. And one of the big values at that school is honoring the students for where they're at, for how they learn. Everybody learns so differently and honoring that uniqueness. So that's why I kind of chose three various things. I'm like, some people are going to respond to maybe the uh, animals. So we have kind of the butterfly and the caterpillar piece. Um, others might respond more to plants. And so we have the seed pods. Others might respond more to the human form. So that's where we had uh, the the kids kind of taking flight with the umbrella. And so this is a little bit how we present our designs in different ways through CAD. We can so show it superimposed into the area. But um, so this was installed and now nobody's seeing it because nobody's in school. <laughs> so a little bit anticlimactic, but um, I'm excited for the kids to go back to school. But this was one of my favorite projects to work on, really. Oh, I think my part's done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, gonna let Dave take over. Okay, thank you, thanks, Jennifer. So I wish we could be here together in the studio the way I had originally envisioned back when we scheduled this meeting, but instead we're gonna try to share with you many of the aspects involved in creating. Jennifer's talked a lot about kind of how we got to this point in creating art, but. Now I'm gonna to try to kind of step you through a lot of the aspects that go into actually creating the art piece. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, I'm an engineer, a maker, problem solver. I just love it when I'm doing those things. Those are part of what it's, makes me go. And so I'm happiest in the studio, applying my metal forming, my fabrication, machining, and welding skills to bring Jennifer's uh, wonderful designs to life. I haven't been especially, I have really been enjoying working with the large scale. Um, it's been especially enjoyable and it brings along many challenges along with work. One of them is just even working in uh, limited space. It's not uncommon for us to be working through our process outside the shop, as you can see. Fabricating large scale art is a little bit like eating an elephant. It take, you just gotta take one bite at a time. I get a lot of satisfaction out of coming up with, uh, sorry. Wake up today, so I'm having trouble with I, we get a lot of satisfaction coming ways to break that project down into manageable parts. These parts are assembled into sub-assemblies, and those sub-assemblies then become our final piece. In addition to the benefit of being able to work on those, so smaller parts also make finishing, transporting, and installing our projects much easier and smoother. Fixtures and jigs, many of them one-off, are all necessary and something that I really enjoy doing. It's all part of the process of creating uh, our fabric fabrication. Even a project in, in the large, even though a project is large, the detail, small deal, details ensure the quality of the art. For example, it's important that all edges are well radius to ensure a quality powder coat finish. 
And so even on a big piece, every little edge has to be cleaned and prepped and ready to go so that we can get the finish that we want out of it. To me, the finishing process is what brings our art to life. Most of our work is finished with either a rust patina or vibrant colors. When it comes to the color, we prefer powder coating primarily because of its lower environmental impact. We did recently give automotive urethane paint a try due to some requirements on that Washington State Arts Commission project Jennifer was just talking about. Turns out urethane enables on-site touch-up, which the commission feels allows them to manage their art inventory easier. We tend to disagree. We believe the modularity of our projects for simple off-site refinishing will lead to higher quality on the product overall. But that's a discussion we're still working out with uh, various commissioning bodies. But now that we have established a relationship with a painter, we do think that we will explore more automotive paints, especially in situations where we want uh, more elaborate gra graphics that powder coating is just not really capable of doing. As I say, we all finishing is done off site. We have a great relationship with a powder coater and now a painter that helps us through and get these beautiful pieces. Bringing public art, art to fruition entails some additional considerations that, we'll spend, that I will spend some time with covering as well. It's all about organization and project management, which are skills, as Jennifer mentioned, that both she and I have honed through many years working as engineers in the high-tech industry. We typically generate a project schedule as part of our design proposal which communicates the expectations to the client, which is really important. It also provides us with a way to manage our production uh, capacity. Some of the things that to consider when you generate a schedule is, first off, customer imposed deadlines. Uh, quite often there's some sort of community event or a fundraising window that means the project has to be completed on a certain date. So then we have to work backwards. We always look for dependencies, what things can be done in parallel and what things have to be done in series. Um, site prep for is an example that can be done outside of the fabrication process while that's going on, whereas structural engineering has to be done before we buy any material. We'll talk about that later why. And we really need to be, I try hard to be realistic about our shop capacity. Uh, I know I'm not very good at it. I'm always optimistic on what we can get done. And Jennifer's good at pushing me to say, no, let's put more time in there. But um, it's all about really making sure that we can uh, promise and meet our commitments as we've gone forward. And so far, we've been pretty good at that. We need some way to communicate the design to structural engineers, permitting bodies and contractors that perform the site prep. Stru uh, detailed design is where I take the 3D and generate a 2D detailed design drawing to communicate all that information. We would require even more detail if we were hiring fabrication as well. Luckily, that's all being done by me, so I kind of have a good idea of what I'm doing before I start. These drawings take me anywhere from 20 to 40 hours to generate. And I, can't, I create them only after we have a design concept that has been approved and they must be completed before structural engineering can even start. Stamp structural engineering package is typically required for any structure over six feet tall. Um, that's a big consideration. Our pieces, obviously, most of that and above. Um, the primary concerns on these things are wind loads and snow loads. And every jurisdiction has a different set of requirements and re needs and specifications that we have to deal with. So wind speed is typically the dominating factor on our pieces and can lead to material or design changes. So that's one reason why 
we rarely risk preparing any material or starting fabrication until the engineering stamp is done and we know we've got it ready to go. Most jurisdictions require some level of permitting with a building permit, typically the minimum. Other permits that may be needed include the right of way permit, traffic control, groundwater. There also could be cultural and agricultural permit requirements depending on the location of the piece. Many art commissions are aware of these requirements, but we found that private parties quite often are not. We've learned to ask about permitting and confirm who is responsible for obtaining permits and arranging inspections if required. We actually prefer it if the clients obtain them. Um, they are more likely to be familiar with local requirements and have some connections to that point, whereas we have to do it uh, remotely otherwise. Site preparation includes the footings, landscaping, both soft and hard, lighting, Additional items that always need to be considered are include power and water if they're necessary. To ensure that we have a smooth installation, we always provide weldments, which is the structure that goes into the concrete. So that way we know what we bring is gonna get bolted in place properly. Uh, we provide templates, so all orientations are correct and in the right direction with engraved uh, laser cut. My acne is to tell them which way is north. Uh, and then we also include shop drawings so that they have a, an overview of what we want done and how. We'll usually be there also try to participate where we can, but in general, um, site prep typically must be handled by a licensed contractor. And so we don't have license in multiple states and multiple locations. So we prefer to have the client handle the site prep. Once again, this is because of their familiarity with local contractors. Ideally we like to have that site prep completed at least several weeks in advance of installation, just in case something does go wrong, we can address it before we show up and can't bolt things in place. In most cases, we deliver our art, we do it ourselves. We have contracted once that was constant project. Uh, we went and hired crating and shipping to have that one taken out, but it was a situation where there was no assembly on site. Each of the umbrellas were completely independent. All they had to do was bolt them into some preset footing. So it felt like a good one to do. Besides, uh, a couple thousand mile drive wasn't quite on our list. So we decided to ship them out. And it worked went really smoothly. We, sit, we had to send along instructions and have them all do it. Um, it's important to account for delivery and, and packing and creating in your estimates when you're doing your project. Um, we give all our projects the white glove treatment and that can be challenging. Um, it's important to adequately secure all these pieces while not causing any damage to all the finishes. And that's a really interesting balancing act. I typically end up building a lot of custom dunnage for every project and use lots and lots of padding. <laughs> Packaging is typically a multi-day endeavor, just getting it ready before we even hit the road. Next. Installation is both exciting and nerve wracking. We put a lot of planning in up front to ensure that setting and assembling the sculpture goes as smooth as possible by scheduling any equipment that's needed in advance, ensuring all our tools, Components, fasteners, with spares are all available. Plan for any road closures if needed, and also make sure there's enough help available. Extra hands are always handy. We, mo we modulize our sculptures so that final assembly requires only fasteners. No welding, no post installation finishing required. This is also helpful and very, uh, promotes the ability to remove or, or move these pieces so the uh, commissioning body or the client now has a piece that they can take apart, maintain, put back together, and we provide instructions on all how to do all that. Um, then once again, some jurisdictions require uh, installation to be done by a contractor. It's gotta be licensed. So we actually prefer that and look for opportunities for the client to hire a local contractor 
And in those cases, then we provide installation oversight, consultation, as well as documented instructions on how to assemble and disassemble the piece. And it's great when we can celebrate after a six, successful installation. Okay. With that. Thank you. That's the end of the presentation. And now we have opportunity for questions and answers. Dave, there's a question here. Um, do you do everything yourselves or do you have other specialists that you subcontract with? The, we, we subcontract out some of the uh, material prep. So in other words, laser cutting. Occasionally on heavy materials, we'll have rolling. Uh, so those great big pipes for the Kennewick one, because of the structural wind loads of 110 mile an hour, we ended up having to go with material tubing that was no way something I could do. So we do have a few suppliers that provide us the, the shaped vent tubing or rolled plates, but most of it we fabricate and do ourselves. The only other thing that we contract out is the finishing work, as I said, powder coating and painting. Well, that was an amazing amount of information. Um, absolutely. I had absolutely no idea how much went into um, the production of some of those pieces. It was, um, it was really wonderful. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, there must be some other questions. Is, um, if anybody has any, um, go ahead and unmute yourselves and, and ask directly. I have. I don't know if anybody can hear me, but um, ask them, Dave and Jennifer. What's next? Oh, you muted yourself. You muted. We you lost you. We, you were unmute. Unmute. Was that what's next, or can we? I unmuted. Okay. Yeah. What's on What's on the horizon? What uh, What have you come out of the pandemic thinking? <laughs> we're out. We're, we're applying. We're, we're trying to fill the pipeline. Uh, we've got several. We actually made a finalist on one recently, and so we're, we're hoping that one can turn into another project. What's interesting is there's work. There's calls going on out there. So there is, seems to be a call for work. We'll see if we can land any of them. Jennifer? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, every, we, had a, we had several things already in the shoot. Um, and those all went through. I think, I think the future, it'll be interesting to see if maybe there's a slowdown for a little while on calls. Um, for me personally, I feel like with uh, the gravity of all the stuff happening in the world, um, I, want, I want to um, have deeper messaging and meaning in some of our artwork. I mean, I still think our, our mission of um, lifting spirits and brightening the world is uh, very well needed, but um, I know from a design and conceptual standpoint, um, I want to work on some deeper meaning and um, uh, address some issues that are very near and dear to my heart and somehow put that out into the world mm -hmm. in our art style. And I am seeing more calls, some really cool calls that are coming out that seem to be addressing these and they want themes that are more about inclusivity and diversity and acceptance. And um, so they're speaking my language. So those are that kind of the cool kind of calls that I get excited about. There's a couple of other questions popped up here. Um, do you teach workshops? We have not. Okay. Um, do you ever build pieces for other artists? At this point, we've been busy enough that we have not done that either. <laughs> uh, so. Phil Steeter wants to know, what's the biggest challenge and the best single skill for making mild steel weatherproof? Weatherproof? Uh, it's the number one is multiple coating levels. Uh, make sure all seams are really sealed up tight. Uh, no sharp edges. Make sure you're fully, you know, you need to seal it. The first time you put, you know, the, the, the dream that you can take natural mild steel and put a clear coat on it and have it not rust is, is not real. 
even powder coat, we typically run three layers of powder coat. We run a, a, an epoxy primer, and then we put a base color, and then we put a clear coat over the top of it. And those have been very robust and done really well. And once again, it's the prep work, no sharp corners, no place where there's no holes, nothing so that the powder flows into every crevice. Those are critical to get long dur durability. If you have sharp edges or corners, then it'll, water will get in there and crack and it's gone. We've, um, we've made it to the eight o'clock hour. Uh, if there are any other questions, I'll leave this open, but I would like to wrap it up um, and thank everybody who came. Thank Jennifer and Dave, uh, especially for a, for a wonderful presentation. And I would also like to um, remind all of our guests that um, we are a member organization. Uh, we are always looking for new members. It's a very diverse, very eclectic group of people from rank amateurs to very skilled professionals. And uh, as Andy likes to say, it's a resource sharing group. We share our knowledge, our resources, uh, just about everything imaginable. So do consider joining if you're not a member already. Um, any other questions? I have, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was still out in the shop when you guys started. You're, you're in the Portland area, right? Is that? We're in Vancouver, Washington. Vancouver, cool. I was just up there casting glass for my current commission. Oh, where at? Who are you? Uh, <clears throat> fire, firehouse? Yeah, yeah. With Greg? Yep, great place. Nice. Fabulous. Uh, where do Come you? Come by sometime. I I will for sure, absolutely. Uh, where do you guys powder coat? Uh, we we work out of a shop in Portland called Masic Industries. It's one okay. where they used to do more and more uh, powder, but they've kind of uh, specialized in ceramics. But they still do work with us because we've got a really good long term relationship. So I'd love to recommend them, but they don't tend to bring in new work. They got such a big work with the ceramics. There's um, M and M here in Vancouver. M and M manufacturing over here in Vancouver that's done work for us as well, powder coat. Yeah, especially the large stuff. We we've got a really super fabulous powder coater here in Bend that like has the okay. best best quality stuff I've ever worked with. Every now and then I wish I had a bigger than eight foot doorway to got it. Like the, the, the rigging to take thing up horizontally to go through the door is been a little yep. bit No, I, I know where you're coming from. That's our challenges too. Dave, there's a question from uh, Harold Linky. Do you seek out calls that match your art or change your art to match the call? But Jennifer answered Thank you. Yeah, I meant to say that. So I, I, I'm getting better at like vetting the calls and if there's themes that I don't resonate with or I know nothing about, I don't touch them. I mean, it really has to be something that I feel like I'm getting better at uh, applying to calls that we at least have a chance in. Um, so, and also, you know, uh, you know, I say anything that's got a really high budget number, you know, I'll see calls that are for $600,000. So, you know, I just pass right by those. Um, but kind of knowing your budget range and knowing your style and if they're looking for whimsy and color, you can read into it. And um, the calls are really interesting and very diverse in nature. What's, what's the difference in the a call that you were unsuccessful with. What about it? Uh, do you ever follow up on a call where you were unsuccessful? Oh, um, yeah. yeah. I often ask, can you, uh, can you tell, tell me why? Um, most of the time they don't respond. Um, I remember, oh, I, yeah, this was interesting. One time I went, because a lot of these uh, ones for cities, uh, they do the jury process and it needs to be open to the public. So I actually went up to Olympia and um, sat in on the jury, which was kind of hard to do because there they show your work up there and then they're all talking about it. Um, but it was really helpful to hear 
other people talk about our artwork and see how it comes across them. Sometimes, sometimes, you know, I don't always know how to describe something and I might hear somebody else use terminology that I'm, I'm like, okay, I like that. And then I'll start adopting that in kind of sometimes the way I talk about our art. But yeah, oftentimes you don't hear back and you don't know if you were X'd off the list immediately or um, you were next in line. Did they know you were in the room when they were jury? Yeah. Be ugly otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to appreciate you two because it's been just a beautiful to watch everything you've made over the years and building this huge portfolio and bigger and bigger work. And I love seeing some of the intricate details that I hadn't seen you talk about before, Dave. I've seen more of Jennifer's, but I just really uh, want to appreciate you for sharing so much. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. You're one of my inspirations. Absolutely. <laughs> and you're mine. <laughs> Should I ask some of the other questions? I think that about wraps it up then. Cool. Um, this has been recorded, and we will uh, put this up on the website within the next few days. Um, I want to thank everybody again for attending and thank you, Jennifer and Dave, for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank Enjoy you. Thanks much. for coming, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.